So we pass between the, the pages of Malachi to Matthew. There's 400 years of silence that is broken. And Luke introduces John the Baptist in a very simple way. He said there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And John, of course, is, is a derivation of that beautiful Hebrew name, Yohanan, the grace of the Lord. A man sent from God whose name was John. And God was now about to speak again. You know, there were many prophets that were sent, but here is a prophet that we're told was specifically sent from the presence of God himself. He was a product of the Spirit. If we turn over to John chapter 5, we have the Lord Jesus Christ testimony to John and what he was sent to do. In John chapter 5, in verse 35, and speaking about John the Baptist, it says that he was a burning and a shining light. And you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Previously, John had said in John chapter 1 about John the Baptist, he was not that light. Now, when that phrase is used in John 1 and verse 8, the Greek word is phos. You're like phosphorus, glowing in the dark, a permanent light. John was not that permanent light. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. But what was John? Well, Jesus says he was a burning and a shining lamp. And the Greek word that's used there is, is a portable hand lamp. You know, it's a, it's a lamp that you put a little bit of oil in and it would light up and would sort of flare up your path for a short time and then it would go out. He was a burning and a shining portable hand lamp, said Jesus. You had to be quick because the light was about to go out. And once it had gone out, you had lost your opportunity. He was a burning and a shining portable hand lamp. As we said, one of the drawbacks to living today is we're not going to get a John the Baptist to warn us about the Lord's coming. And so what we need are brethren who can stand up and illuminate our path, who can flare up our path for a moment to, to show us what we are for a moment of time until that permanent foss arrives from which nobody can be extricated, our Lord Jesus Christ. And there he was, John giving men just a, a moment of time to see themselves for what they truly were until the Lord Jesus Christ came, the great light, which would never go out. They needed it at that time, and, and boy, do we need that today. We need that light flaring up in our path so that brothers and sisters can set their sails for the kingdom of God. And they really needed it because Micah had said this. He said, the sun will go down over the prophets. The seers will be ashamed. There is no answer from God, said Micah. And those words were fulfilled when the last prophet, Malachi, set down his pen. There was darkness over the land. The Greeks came in. The Persians came in. There was no answer from God. But look at the next verse. But truly, I am full of of the power by the Spirit of Yahweh. And that 400-year darkness was now about to be dispelled by one who came in the Spirit and the power of Elijah, which was the Spirit and power of his God, to dispel that 400-year period of darkness. He was a man for his time. And here he comes now in the person of John. But boy, was the darkness thick that John had to dissipate. He came into a world that was seething. Jewish nationalism seethed and fermented as it, as it languished beneath the, the iron yoke of Rome. The nation, God's ecclesia in the wilderness, as they were once known, is now going to be divided into many classes. The darkness indeed was thick. Many people had no hope. Many people had no ambition. It was a dark, dark period in the nation's history. There was no middle class at all 
when John came on the scene. You were either very rich or very poor. And the poor would have found it very, very hard to find any sense of hope, to find any sense of, of, of optimism in life. There was no middle class. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus was a perfect depiction of life at that time. And Jewish nationalism, which really could never be quelled, seethed and fermented as it tried to throw off the iron yoke of Rome, looking for anything that might give them some sense of hope in life. And so God's people, brothers and sisters, were divided into many classes. And this is who John came to. There were the Pharisees, the clergy of the day, who were zealous of tradition over and above the word of God. Proud and arrogant, they were they were too proud to even submit to the iron yoke of Rome. There were the Sadducees, who don't believe in angel, spirit, or resurrection, who possessed for this, for this time the office of the priesthood, and as such had the key to the temple treasury chest. People who live for this life, and based upon how you did in business, that to them was a measure of how God blessed you. There were the scribes and the lawyers, people who used the Bible to legislate against the poor on behalf of the rich. There were the zealots, hot-headed fanatics, the Sakari, as they were later known, who didn't think anything to, to slit a throat, to do anything, they tried to get rid of the Roman overlord. There were the Herodians, people whose policy was, well, if you can't beat them, join them, who took off the plain robe of a scribe to wear the purple of Herod's court. To all those classes, brothers and sisters, John the Baptist was sent. There was a man sent from God whose name was John who would flare up and show men for a moment what they truly were and dispel that darkness so that men could be ready for the Lord's coming. And you know, amidst all of that chaos, there was still a flickering expectancy of Messiah among the old people, the Zechariases and the Elizabeths, people who could remember better days, who saw nothing in the, the present generation and just yearned within their hearts for, for Messiah who was to come. That was the world. With all of its class distinctions that John came, it desperately needed this, this light. You know, on other occasions, God might not have done this. He might have chosen a different method. But so great was the need, he, he introduced into the nation this, this stark aberration to wake people up. And that's something that we need too, isn't it, brothers and sisters? You know, sometimes we have to look at a character like John to, to see the issues of life as, as clear as they are. Because it's easy to forget about them and the, and the, the hubbub of this society. People have become apathetic. People had become lethargic. You know, I don't know what it's like here, but the city where I come from, there are 200 Christadelphians of all makes and models. And my, my worry is, is I, I don't see, I think, the enthusiasm that we should be having for the return of Christ. You know, we're buying and we're selling and we're, we're building and we're planting and we're consumed with all those things. And, and, and we need a character like John, don't we, to, to sort of shake us up, to, to get us out of our our lethargy, and to bring us back to, to some sort of, of an equilibrium. Now, although these words that I'm about to quote to you don't pertain to John the Baptist, they fit his life and his, his purpose absolutely beautifully. Remember we said John means the grace of the Lord. Paul to Titus in his second chapter. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And there he was, the grace of God, 
hath appeared, teaching us that we should deny worldly lusts. John didn't have any possessions. You know, the camel skin doesn't have to be dry clean too often. Grasshoppers don't need much cooking. Denying ungodliness, denying worldly lust, until the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and those words really could form a caption, couldn't they, over the top of John's life. And so the lamp was lit. The little portable hand lamp was lit in Luke chapter 1. So let's come back to Luke chapter 1. And in order that we might not miss the point that the light was needed, Luke is going to tell this most excellent Theophilus the background into which he came. Luke chapter 1 in verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. Herod. Now, who was he? Well, Herod is a title. It means heroic. And he was there as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Because many years earlier, Moses had told them that if they did not keep the words of this law, strangers would rule over him. Well, Herod was an Edomite. You can't get a greater stranger to a Jew than an Edomite. He was a man who was absolutely devoid of any morality at all. He married <laughs> ten times. He was a product of his age. He didn't he didn't think, think twice to murder the, the babies in, in Bethlehem. He was a man who was known as Herod the Great. And he was great in everything that this world calls great. He ruled over Judea with an iron fist for nearly 40 years. And he had temporarily pacified the Jews because he built for them a temple which had gained for them some favor. I mean, Herod understood that if you're ever going to control a people like the Jews, you've got to throw them a bone every now and then. And so he built them a temple, which Jesus said was 46 years in building. You know, it took another 20 years to finish that temple. So how long was it in building? 66 years. And it got built just in time for the Romans to knock it down. But he was a man who was great in everything that men call great. Well, you know, at that same time, in verse 15 of Luke chapter 1, there was another man who rose up who was great. For he shall be great, verse 15, in the sight of the Lord and in nobody else's sight. So here we have Herod the Great, who the world would admire, who the world would vote for, who was great in everything that men call great, but God voted for John the Baptist. He will be great, says verse 15, in the sight of the Lord. And there's the contrast. Herod the Great and a man great in the sight of the Lord. Well, coming back to verse 5, Luke tells us that this boy would be the son of Zechariah. Now, everything that Luke tells us here is, is of great significance. You know that Luke is very detail-oriented in both his gospel and in the Acts. And he wants to tell us all about this little family, Zechariah and Elizabeth, who were the parents of our John the Baptist. So Zechariah was married to Elizabeth. Now, if we look at the meanings of those names, we have Zechariah, Yah hath remembered. Elizabeth means the oath of ale. And John, the mercy of God. You, know, you look over at verse 72 of this same chapter, there is an obvious play upon the names of of this family. In the song of Zechariah, which we won't have time to get to, he said this, that God would perform the mercy promised to our fathers to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. There is an obvious play you can see there upon the names of this family. Zechariah, Yah hath remembered. Elizabeth, the oath of Ale. John, the mercy of God. Now, just tuck those meanings away in your mind because they'll come back up just shortly in, in a second. Now, this Zechariah, we're told in verse 5, was of the course of Abiah. Now, the courses go back to David. You know, David, as the priesthood expanded, the, as, as, sorry, as the nation expanded, the priesthood 
by necessity also had to expand. And so he divided the priesthood, didn't he, into 24 courses. And one of those courses was the course of Abiah. The course of Abiah, if we go back to 1 Chronicles 24 and verse 10. That's the course that Zechariah is a member of. Now, when we look at which course it was, the course of Abiah in the book of Chronicles happens to be the eighth course. The eighth course, the number of a new beginning. And wasn't that John as he came into the land of Judea? He was a new beginning in every sense of the word. It was the eighth course, and of course you'll know that it was on the eighth day, wasn't it, that that rite of circumcision was performed upon a Jewish boy. And circumcision primarily taught, didn't it, the cutting off of the flesh and that the children of promise would not be produced by natural means, but rather by spiritual means. Because when God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, he could not have a child. But it reminded Abraham of the fact that the child of promise that was to come would be God's son. And Luke again, in the Acts of the Apostles, puts this together so wonderfully. He says, he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begat Isaac. Now, many years of time, of course, came between those two things. But circumcision being performed on the eighth day, and the course of Abiah being the eighth course, it spoke about God's workings amongst men. It was God working in the lives of men. And John here, of course, is not begotten in the same way that Jesus was. But of course, as we'll see shortly, if, if God had not intervened, in the case of these two old people, John the Baptist would never have seen the light of day. It was the eighth course, speaking of that, that new beginning connected with, with circumcision. Now, what about his mom? That was his dad. That's a pretty special heritage he has. What about his mom? Well, she's even greater because it says there in verse 5 that she was of the daughters of Aaron. Now, that's impressive. She's not just a Levite. She's of the daughters of Aaron. And in fact, Elishaba, Elizabeth is Elishaba in Hebrew. Elishaba was the name of Aaron's wife. So this child's got a pretty nice heritage. His qualifications for priesthood, John the Baptist, were absolutely impeccable. He's got a mother and a father, both, who were in the priestly line. You know, a mother who, who comes from the family of Aaron. Why is he down in the wilderness wearing a camel skin? You know, how odd it is that, that a man with those bloodlines is down in the wilderness of Judea not a high priest, but wearing a camel skin and not garments for glory and beauty. So there's, there's some, some interesting things about John that we need to unearth here. So just tuck that away too. Remember the meanings of the names. And then also remember that this is a boy who has got impeccable qualifications for priesthood. I mean, qualities, of, you know, qualifications that really are par excellence. I mean, there was not even the high priests themselves at this time would have had those qualifications. But John does, and we'll see why shortly. But this old couple, brothers and sisters, had a problem. And you know, we, we've all got a cross to bear, don't we, of some kind. You know, we've all got an old habit. We've all got a, a trial that really has been eating at us sometimes for like 20 years. And, and this was theirs in, in verse 7. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. She was barren. And, and so notorious was this barrenness that if you just skip over to verse 36, in verse 36, she was actually given a title in the sixth month with her who was called barren. Now in the Greek, it's the barren one. She's the barren one, tragically. And I don't know if people would have said that out of any disrespect or, or trying to, to belittle her, but, you know, this, this, here's a family whose bloodlines are so pure that, you know, this poor old lady became known as, as the barren one, and it was sort of just a, a tragedy 
to look at this family with, with all of these great bloodlines, and yet you, you see that they can't have a child. What a struggle that must have been for them. You know, especially in Israel where it was a joy to have children because they all wanted to be the one to, to bear that Messiah who would come. But, but what was their attitude? You know, attitude is, 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 is a lot in life. Attitude is a lot. Well, here's their attitude. If you come back to, to verse 6, you know, it's, it's easy to give up. It's easy to ask God, well, why is this happening to me? And they were both righteous. Now notice this, verse 6, before God. Now that means it's genuine righteousness. They're righteous not before other people. You know, we sometimes think we're righteous because we do things in front of other people. What's ma- what matters is, is that we do those things in front of God. Well, they were righteous before God. It was genuine. And they continued to worship and walk in all the commandments and the ordinances of the law and were blameless. So the trial didn't produce any bitterness in them, did it? They continued. If anything, they were more steadfast in the face of that trial. Righteous before God and were blameless. Think about the, the incredible compliment that's given there by Luke. And the word blameless doesn't mean that they were without sin, but of course it meant that under the law they would have made all the offerings. They were at meeting every week. They were at Bible class every week. When the ecclesia needed a job, they were there. They walked in all the commandments blameless. And they prayed about it. They prayed about that problem. And they're, who knows how old? They're well stricken in years. Now, how old that is in verse 7, I don't know. But they kept on praying for a child. They didn't stop. As old as they were. They kept on praying. Look at verse 13. Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Now, the word prayer there is desis. D-E-E-S-I-S. It means a specific prayer petition. It wasn't just any sort of prayer. It was a specific petition that they made. And and I'd make the suggestion to you that despite the age of this old couple, they are still making a specific petition for a boy. The word prayer there means something specific. It's not a general word, but something specific. As old as they were, they kept on praying for a child. Now, just picture an older couple who doesn't have children. They're praying day in and day out for a child. Now, now look at that face. You know, how often do we we just give up when problems arise? You know, we we need help or the, the ecclesia needs help. Maybe we get together and we have a special prayer. And and the first sign of difficulty, you see people in the meeting wanting to give up. This man is still praying and asking God to do it despite his age. Now, was he rewarded by God? Was he ever? Look at verse 8. It came to pass while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple before in, into the temple of the Lord. His lot. Now, this is where you kind of need to to look at how that worked in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, because you won't exactly find them doing it this way in the law. The priesthood had changed a little bit. But the great honor of any, any member of that family, the great honor was to burn incense in that holy place. That was what they all strived to do. And because there were so many people at that time that wanted to do it, they drew lots for it. And when your name came out, you burned incense on that one day. And then after that, your name was thrown out because you had had your privilege. You only got it one time in your whole life to go in there and burn incense. And on the one day that Zacharias would ever get that privilege to go in there and burn incense, There is Gabriel standing on the right side of the altar. He's been praying all of his life for a child. And the one time his name comes out of the hat, to use a modern expression, the one time his name comes out of the hat, and says, okay, it's your turn, 
His only chance to do it, his whole life, he walks in, there's Gabriel standing on the right side of the altar. Does God answer prayer in remarkable ways? Well, he went in there, and there was El Gibor. Not just any angel, but Gabriel. Edersheim, who was a, a Jew who became a Christian, wrote very wonderfully about the, the customs of the temple in the days of Christ. And you see that last phrase there, for the first time in his life and for the last, this service would devolve upon him. That's the only time he ever would have gone in there to burn incense. His name came up that day. And there is Gabriel listening to that prayer and watching that man as he burns incense. And now he is going to appear to him with this great message. Now, where did Gabriel last appear in our Bibles? Well, he's here in Luke chapter 1. Well, the last time he appeared in our Bibles was Daniel chapter 9, where he appeared to Daniel to, to give him the prophecy of the, the 70 weeks. Now, I told you to remember the meanings of, of the names. But Daniel, in his prayer, you'll find these three things. He first asked for God to remember that the 70 years of captivity have come to an end. In verse 4, he appeals for mercy. And he explains in verse 11 that the reason why they've suffered 70 years of captivity is because they hadn't followed the oath written in the law of Moses. Zacharias, Yahweh hath remembered. John, the grace of God. Elizabeth, the oath of Ael. And this, this great angel now spans those two bookends. He appeared in Daniel chapter 9, 500 years earlier to Daniel, to an aged man who had been praying. And then he reappears in Luke chapter 1 to an aged man who had been praying. And you see all of those details all matched up. And Gabriel was listening to that man, and now he's listening to this man. To show the nation mercy, God was now going to act in response to this great prayer. And let, let that be an encouragement to us, brothers and sisters. You know, how many years Zechariah had been praying, we don't know. But God finally responded. We've got to learn faith and we've got to learn patience when we come before God and ask what we need. So he's standing there. We come back to Luke chapter 1 there in verse 11 on the right side of the altar of incense. The right side. Now, of course, most of us would be right-handed, wouldn't we? And, and the right hand, of course, is that hand which is the most dexterous. Now, it matters not with God, be it right hand or left. But you know what we read of in the Psalms is the saving power of God's right hand. My right, your left. It's a symbol of power and action. So he's, a, he's not on the left side of the altar, is he? He's on the right side because he's now going to act and give this old couple a boy who would be the forerunner of their Messiah. The right side of the altar. Just take down these references about the right hand. Psalm 20, verse 6, and Psalm 60, verse 5. And those two references are all about the saving strength of God's right hand. And that's the saving strength that's now going to be manifested as he stands there, this mighty angel on the right hand of the altar of incense. You know, the altar of incense being used here in connection with Zechariah is, is very interesting. I'd like to just turn this one up in Exodus chapter 30. Just come back with me to Exodus chapter 30. Because the altar of incense was a very unique item in the holy place. It's described in terms of a house. The altar of incense was a little house in the holy place. And there in that holy place was a replica of every house in Israel. Now just look quickly at Exodus 30 and verse 3. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about. Exodus 30, verse 3. Now, if you have a margin, the margin of my Bible for top is roof. And the margin for sides is walls. So the altar of incense is described in terms of a house. It's got a roof and it's got walls. Now, 
The altar of incense was a little box, like, like not big at all. But it's got a roof and it's got walls. So what's that saying? It's saying that every house in Israel ought to have been a house of prayer. Now you think about the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth. What was it? It was a house of prayer. And there in the holy place was a replica of every house in Israel. It had a flat roof and it had walls. Deuteronomy 22, they had to construct their houses with a flat roof and walls. And so you think about that in terms of Zechariah and his house. Was it a house of prayer? Was it ever? And standing there on the right side of the altar of incense, what his house had been all of his life, now there is Gabriel to, to give him this wonderful and cheering news. Coming back to Luke chapter 1, he was told that his name was to be John, the grace of God. You know, Elijah had called for Yahweh Elohim of armies in 1 Kings 19, but Elijah was shown, no, that's not what spirit we need to have. We need this spirit. John appears, the grace of the Lord, which leads men to repentance. And he was to be the cause of great joy and gladness, says Luke 1 in verse 14. And many shall rejoice at his birth, because of course, this one was to signal the forerunner of the Messiah for which so many of them had been waiting. There would be joy and gladness, as, as there should be at the, at the birth of any child, especially this one. More on that phrase just in a moment. Now I ask you to remember the impeccable qualifications that John would have had for priesthood. And we get to that in verse 15, because this is what God said he's going to be. It says, he will be great in the sight of the Lord, Luke 1, 15, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. In other words, he's going to be a Nazarite. He will drink neither wine nor strong drink. Now, the Nazarite vow was really given just for one reason. So you see, God told Israel at Sinai, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. And then he gave a law which said it could never happen. Because unless you are of the tribe of Levi and of the family of Aaron, you never could be a priest. Well, how then could the words of Exodus 19 ever be fulfilled? You shall be unto me a kingdom of priest. That's where the Nazarite vow comes in. Because the Nazarite vow was the opportunity for anyone in Israel, either man or woman, for a given period to imitate the high priest. So the high priest was told not to drink wine. So the Nazarite wasn't to drink wine. The high priest was told never to touch a dead body. The Nazarite was told never to touch a dead body. As the, the high priest wore the, the great crown upon his head with, with the name of God uh, inscribed across it, so the Nazarite, when he grew his hair long, he would have worn it in a turban, in, the, in like sort of a turban, like what we see today, which was very similar in shape, as you can see, to the mitre of the high priest. He's going to be a Nazarite, but, but, but hang on a second. I thought John already had every qualification to be a priest. Why does John have to be a Nazarite? Nazarite, the Nazarite vow was for people who could never be priest. And yet the record says that he's going to be a Nazarite. Gabriel says, you know, from his mother's womb, he's got to be a Nazarite. Well, what's the reason for that? John had no reason to be a Nazarite. He's already in the priestly line. Well, who was greater, the Nazarite or the high priest? Interesting question. Who was greater? You got a 50% chance, I guess. The Nazarite. Why? Because why was the high priest there? The high priest was there by dint of birth, by a carnal commandment, as Paul says in Hebrews 7. Why is the Nazarite doing this? Because he wants to. Because he loves his God so much and reveres his God so much, he wants to be like his high priest so much that he says, I'm going to be a Nazarite because I want to be like my high priest. The high priest was just there by dint of birth. He had no choice. 
the Nazarite, in a very real sense, was greater than the high priest. The high priest was there by a carnal commandment, but the high priest was there, but the Nazarite, sorry, was there because he loved his God. He's got to be a Nazarite, says Gabriel. It's as though, brothers and sisters, the law is being set aside in this boy. You know, John has absolutely nothing to do with the law. Here is the spirit of the law, a separate one, as the word Nazarite means, a separate one in every sense of the word. And it's going to happen, says verse 15, from his mother's womb. Which again, that's a difference from the, the law too, because a Nazarite normally could pick how long he would be a Nazarite for. You could do it for a week, you could do it for a month, you could do it for a year. But Gabriel says, no, he's going to be a Nazarite. He's going to be a separate one from his birth. This is my work. I mean, how much longer do you think Zacharias and Elizabeth were alive after this? I mean, probably not very long. They're old and well stricken in years already. So who then was going to be his father? Well, it was going to be God. He was going to take over and be his father. And John was in the deserts for much of his early childhood. So who was his mentor? Who was his guide? But Yahweh. This child indeed was to be a product of his maker, a Nazarite, a separate, work, a separate one in every sense of the word. So Zacharias is informed by the angel that he's going to have a child. But poor old Zacharias. You know, his faith was there, wasn't it? You know, he was blameless according to the law. But, you know, like it is with, with us sometimes, brothers and sisters, you know, when God answers prayers in your life, you're, you're sometimes just so staggered and, and surprised you can't believe it. And that's what happens here with, with Zacharias. You, you stop thinking for a second. You know, we pray every day, don't we, that Christ is going to come. And, you know, when that knock comes on the door, you know, we, we might just be so, so overcome with the whole moment, we might not believe it. And the angel says, he's here. You're like, who? That's kind of what happens with, with Zacharias. It's, it's all his hope and it's all his aspirations, but momentarily he, he doesn't believe because the fullness of the, the expectation doesn't match the fullness of the realization. And so we read there in verse 18, Zacharias says to Gabriel, well, well how shall I know this? You know, for I am old and, and, and my wife is well stricken in years. So he temporarily, doesn't he, loses a little bit of faith. You know, that question, that very same question there in verse 18, you might recall, was asked by another faithful man. So faithful that he became known as the father of the faithful. Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? But in Abraham's case, it was, it was a question of faith. He was asking what the modus operandi was for how he would have a boy. And immediately, God showed Abraham the sacrifice. But Zechariah just temporarily loses heart. He's, he's so overwhelmed with the excitement of seeing Gabriel that it says that he doesn't believe. And so, what was his penalty? What did that lack of belief cost Zechariah? Well, verse 19 says, I am El Gibor that stands in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb. He struck dumb. Now, why would God strike a man like that dumb? It's interesting. He's, he's in the holy place. And, you know, normally when you, you came out of the holy place, everybody's standing outside waiting for Zechariah to come out. You know, when, when the priest came out, he would come out with the, the blessing, Yahweh, bless thee and keep thee. Yahweh, make his face to shine upon thee. And Zechariah comes out. He can't speak. It seems harsh. Why would he be struck dumb? For not believing, verse 19, these glad tidings. Let's come back to our chapter, Isaiah 40. Because here it is. Glad tidings, where's that from? Isaiah chapter 40. This is the, the chapter of John that we have to keep coming back to to get our bearings. 
He's struck dumb for not believing the glad tidings. Verse 9. We know these words so well, don't we, from the, the Messiah. Isaiah 40, verse 9. O Zion, that bring us good tidings. Get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. So what were they supposed to do here with the, the voice of the good tidings? They were to lift it up with strength. Be not afraid. But Zechariah doesn't believe the glad tidings. So what happens to his voice? He's struck dumb. You see, it's scriptural that it be so. The voice was, the, the tidings were supposed to be proclaimed in a loud voice. Zechariah doesn't believe the tidings, so he's struck dumb. But, but who's the voice of Isaiah chapter 40? Who's the voice in this chapter? Verse 3, it's the voice of his own boy. And whilst Zechariah may be temporarily struck dumb, the voice of his boy now comes reverberating out of that chapter. And so because these glad tidings are supposed to be spoken in a loud voice, Zechariah doesn't believe it, and he's struck dumb. But who is speaking loudly in this chapter? Well, it's the voice of his own boy. So he's struck dumb because the voice said, lift up your voice with strength. So let's just summarize this in terms of the, the slide that we have before us. So how do we know that Luke's mind is in Isaiah chapter 40. Well, firstly, we see Zacharias is, is struck dumb for not believing the glad tidings. And if we doubted that that's the answer, the context of this chapter is about the birth of John the Baptist and the sending forth of the voice. So that lets us know that we're on, we're on sure ground. Well, let's come back to Luke chapter 1 and see how Luke just picks this up so beautifully to show that his mind was right here in, in John's chapter, in Isaiah chapter 40, because there are two other points that, that come up in this chapter that Luke is, is at pains to record. Mary, having been given her promise that she was to have the Messiah, it says there in verse 39 of Luke chapter 1, that Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah. Now, Luke could have easily told us what that city of Judah was, couldn't he? In Luke chapter 1, in verse 39, but he doesn't. It just says that Mary went into the hill country, into a city of Judah. What does Isaiah 40 say? Get thee into the high mountain, the hill country. Say to the cities of Judah. She went into a city of Judah. Proclaim, behold, your God. He's coming. The glad tidings that that God is interested in our affairs and he's about to send a voice to save us. Proclaim that with a loud voice. Zacharias is struck dumb for not believing it. Mary goes forth and proclaims it upon the hill country of Judah. But what about Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, the other character in this story? Verse 42 specifically notes when her prayer of thanksgiving was expressed, and this we're told was a spirit-inspired prayer. It says that she spoke up with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women to Mary, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And look at all of Luke's allusions we have there to that grand chapter of Isaiah 40. So Zechariah lost heart momentarily for not believing the glad tidings, and he's, he's struck dumb. And you know, when Zechariah's mouth is finally opened, at the, the birth of, of John the Baptist, there comes forward in verse 67 of this chapter one of the most remarkable and scintillating songs you've ever heard. You know, we had to eliminate that consideration because five sessions in an afternoon would be even harder than four. But if we had a, a number five, we, we definitely would have looked at that song. He, he, once he learns the lesson, he speaks one of the most glorious songs that you can read in your Bibles from verse 67 down to the end of this chapter. And so let's finish with verse 24. This remarkable, faithful couple is now told that they're going to, to have a child. 
So what does Elizabeth do? And after those days, Luke 1, verse 24, his wife Elizabeth conceived. Finally, here it is. All of their hopes and prayers. And she hid herself five months. What does John mean? It means the grace of God. And she hid herself five months to think about the grace of God. And the number five, brothers and sisters, everywhere in the Bible is the number of grace. You know, you, saw, you see it with Abraham and Sarah. You know, God adds the fifth consonant of his name, making it the fifth consonant of their name because they were heirs together of the grace of life. When Israel redeemed the unclean animals, they did so with the fifth part. Five is everywhere the number of grace. And so to think about her boy that was to be born, she, she went away and hid herself for five months to think about that. Where do you think she went? Well, I think she went into the wilderness. You know, she didn't go around saying, look at me, God has taken away my reproach. She didn't want to share that news with the world. She just wanted to share it with God. And so she went away, brothers and sisters, I think, into the wilderness. Like mother, like son. To allow the voice of God to, to speak to her heart. And you can just imagine, can't you, that, is that, that child formed in her womb. In the wilderness prepare ye the way of Yahweh. And make straight in the desert a highway for our God. She goes away into the wilderness to hear the voice. And in our next study, that's exactly where we're going to meet her son. Her son will be in the wilderness, and we'll look at one of the most thrilling studies that you can do in the scriptures, the day of John's showing unto Israel.